good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the fourth lecture in the Polytechnic uh, School of Engineering and Sloan Foundation uh, lecture series in cybersecurity. Uh, uh, I'm Nasser Memon. I'm a professor in the Computer Science and Engineering Department out here at uh, NYU Engineering, and uh, I will. Be, I have the honor of introducing the speakers today. Uh, before I do that, uh, let me point out to uh, our listeners, the audience who is online, that they can tweet their questions to hashtag reducing cyber risk uh, and follow at cyber lecture or they can also email uh, their questions to cyber lecture series at poly.edu and these will be moderated and presented to the panel uh, later. So our first speaker today is our Dean, uh, Dr. Katipalli Srinivasan. Uh, uh, Dr. Srinivasan is not only a noted physicist and engineer, uh, but he is a person who understands what is it that makes a school successful? Uh, Srini, as we endearingly call him, and that's how I heard he prefers to be called, uh, has been at the lead of Poly during a very historical sort of time, in, in, uh, or a very important time in the history of the school, uh, and he has been instrumental in bringing this historically important engineering school in Brooklyn uh, together with one of the world's largest research universities, that is NYU. Uh, it's his vision that brought the merger together, and it's his vision that's what makes uh, it exciting to work here at, at Polytechnic. And uh, it's my pleasure to invite Srini to the stage to say a few words. Thank you, Nasir. Uh, good morning to all of you. I have a great pleasure in welcoming you to NYU Polytechnic School of Engineering. Uh, this is a compromise uh, between the old name Polytechnic and the uh, NYU um, with which we merged over a little over two months ago. And the main reason for the merger is the complementarity of strengths of the two institutions. Our goal is to maintain the best uh, traditions of both while building a stronger future. This morning, we are very pleased to bring together leaders from across government, academia, and the private sector to gain better understanding of the ever-growing cyber risks. It's an irony that the same technologies that make it possible for all of us to collaborate and communicate across great divides also expose us to huge risks. Today we are fortunate to have with us a group of esteemed leaders in the field of security, including Ms. Samara Moore, the Director of Cybersecurity Critical Infrastructure Protection from the White House. Ms. Moore will describe to us the implications of the latest policy enunciated by President Obama. Thank you, Ms. Moore, for being here. Samara Moore will then be followed by a distinguished panel of leaders from the Department of Homeland Security and the National Institute of Standards and Technology, as well as Con Edison and at and They will all discuss risks to privacy and possible strategies and solutions to obviate them. Today's event would not have been possible without the generous support from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. The Sloan Foundation makes it possible for universities to ask vital questions and to answer them if possible. Without this continued support, not only would events like this not be possible, but also research in several fields of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and economics would be greatly stymied. We are fortunate to have the president of Sloan Foundation Professor Paul Jaskow with us. Thank you, sir, for being with us. To all the other distinguished colleagues and officials who are here, a special welcome. 
For the past decade, the School of Engineering has been at the forefront of cybersecurity research, education, and policy, not only through academic research, but also through the work of the Center of Interdisciplinary Studies in Security and Privacy, and through our online cybersecurity virtual master's program, which has been recognized by Sloan Consortium as one of the nation's outstanding online programs. Two questions and one thought on each of them, and I will close. What will prevent a number of the students whom we train from going onto the dark side? 10,000 students participated in the program that uh, Nasser runs. And it's interesting to see how Nasser himself feels about it. He is a serious computer scientist, but he views that the true safety from cyber threats lies in human psychology. Therefore, the need to merge technological programs with other broader aspects of human endeavor. Our own approach allows our researchers and students to think about a computer, not only a computer code, and not only a code as something that can be made unbreakable, but rather, when we write it, we need to examine how an attacker plans to compromise it. At the National Mathematics Board meeting that I attended this uh, weekend, just past, I heard that most of the cybersecurity work happens in classified government circles. I imagine it's true of private sector as well. In fact, the statement was made that in the open domain, we don't even know what we don't know. Can this exclusionary access be helpful to the society at large? How best to reach out to the citizenry at large and educate them on these matters? I'm pretty sure that this will be a part of the discussion that goes on. Finally, I want to thank Bob Ubel, who is uh, sitting here, and his team, who are dispersed uh, throughout uh, this auditorium, for all the hard work they have put in to put the event together. Please join me in thanking them in the usual way. Thank you. Thank you, Srini. Uh, our next speaker uh, is Paul Josko, from, who is the president of the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Uh, as Srini acknowledged, uh, this event would not have been possible uh, without their support. And not just this event, but many other such activities, not just at NYU Poly, but across the country uh, that Sloan makes possible. Uh, I could go on for hours talking about the importance of Sloan uh, to the academic community, uh, but instead I'll just spend a couple of minutes introducing the president of Sloan Foundation, uh, Paul Josko. Uh, a Cornell and Yale alum, Dr. Josko has authored six books and over 120 scholarly articles. He serves as a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and chairs the National Academy's Board on Science, Technology, and Economic Policy. He has served on the boards of National Grid, TransCanada, and is a distinguished fellow of the American Economic Association and the fellow of the Econometric Society and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, in his spare time, he has served on the board of trustees at Yale University and the Board of Overseers at, of the Boston Symphony Orchestra. His teaching and research has focused on industrial organization, energy and envir environmental economics, uh, competition policy, and government regulation of industry. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce and welcome Dr. Paul Josko. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me to be here uh, and uh, uh, to help to support this activity. Uh, let me add my own welcome uh, to uh, Ms. Samara Moore, uh, who's been kind enough to come up from, uh, from Washington and to the, to, to the panel. Uh, let me start by just saying a few things about the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Uh, the Sloan Foundation is a, a private foundation uh, located here in New York City. 
uh, with an endowment of about $1.9 billion. Uh, uh, we provide grants to support research and broad-based education and science, which includes mathematics, uh, technology, and, uh, and economics. Uh, most of our grant making takes place uh, through specific programs in these general areas to grantees located uh, throughout the United States, Canada, uh, and a number of other countries. Uh, we also have a civic program uh, which makes grants to institutions in the New York City area uh, consistent with our broader uh, mission to support research and education, science, technology, and economics. Uh, and uh, as uh, we heard before, uh, our support for this uh, lecture series, NYU Polytechnic uh, Engineering School, uh, is out of our civic program. And Paula Olszewski, who's the program director uh, in charge of our civic program and actually organized this activity, is sitting here. Uh, uh, thank, thank her for her, her efforts. Uh, I'm no expert on cybersecurity. Uh, however, you heard I went to two Ivy League schools, so I can speak for 10 minutes on almost anything. Uh, uh, in all seriousness, uh, I do follow these issues closely as an economist uh, with special interests in the energy industries, uh, as a corporate director of firms in the energy uh, and financial services sectors, uh, as a 35-year uh, long uh, professor at a major research university, MIT, uh, as the president of a foundation that uh, started supporting uh, big data initiatives with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey uh, uh, almost 15 years ago, and of course as a concerned citizen. Uh, our economy has and will benefit enormously from uh, it, the innovations that have dramatically increased access to and utilization of growing volumes of digital information, statistical and computational advances to make effective use of this information, related advances in digital science, and ongoing enhancements to the infrastructure uh, that makes it possible for producers of information and consumers of information uh, to uh, get together. <laughs> However, the ultimate advances, the, the ultimate value of the, these advances depend on adequate investments in critical infrastructure elements, efficient operation of this infrastructure, continued innovation in the components of this infrastructure, reasonable terms and conditions for access to the infrastructure, and the subject of this lecture series, better understanding the issues and actions needed to mitigate cyber risks associated with using and operating this, this infrastructure, and last but not least, the implementation of effective responses to cyber risks. There are, of course, a wide range of potential cyber risks associated with the interconnected information economy that is growing uh, exponentially. From risks that threaten national security, to risks associated with protecting intellectual property, to risks that threaten the continuing operation of government uh, agencies, private firms, uh, research institutions, and yes, even foundations to risks that threaten personal privacy, to risks associated with hackers who think this just plain cool to show that they can disable pieces of the infrastructure or steal protected information. Dealing with these risks requires institutional changes, changes in how people use the infrastructure are educated and managed, and advances in hardware, software, and behavioral solutions. Both the risks and the potential solutions vary widely from sector to sector. Of course, these risks are, have not gone unnoticed, and there's no shortage of very expensive initiatives underway in most sectors of the economy to respond to cyber risks. Uh, given my own experience with uh, uh, the energy sector, uh, I, tend to, I tend to look at it as an example. Uh, in the electric power sector, for example, uh, there's an alphabet soup of institutions working on responses to cyber threats uh, uh, and spending huge amounts of money uh, doing so. Uh, they include NERC and FERC and ISOs and regional reliability councils, thousands of entities that own pieces of the electric power infrastructure, all interacting with DOE, Homeland Security, the NRC, state regulators, the FBI, local police agencies, and so on. Uh, can we bring order to something that sometimes seems like it's a little chaotic? I read the lyrics, but sometimes I think that the music is missing in all this activity. Lots of activity, lots of money being spent, but are we gaining ground on the increasing sophistication of cyber threats? So I'm especially interested to learn more this morning about the efforts to implement Cybersecurity Order 13636, I hope I got the number right, uh, that calls for an intensive federal effort to adopt a common national framework aimed at reducing the cyber risk to critical infrastructure. 
is a common framework really feasible? What is it? How do we implement it efficiently in this highly decentral economy that we have in the United States? I look forward to learning more from Samara Moore and from our panel about these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, finally, we will start the main event of the day, uh, uh, and the event will be moderated by Michael Corden. I've known uh, Michael for many years, uh, and he's, an, he's a good friend of uh, our program, cybersecurity program here at uh, Polytechnic uh, School of Engineering. Uh, Michael is the VP of Next9, and uh, who you see outside uh, having a little booth there. Uh, Michael has been instrumental in developing the suite for cybersecurity software products for critical infrastructure. Uh, he has, prior to that, he has worked for HP and Exxon and has founded his own companies which were acquired by larger corporations. Uh, he has authored 16 patents and has been the recipient of multiple industry awards He's a graduate of MIT and has an MA from Columbia, as well as our sister school across the river, uh, the Quran Institute of Mathematical Sciences. Please welcome Michael to the stage. Um, thank you. Professor Memon, uh, Dean Trinivasan, and Dr. Jasko. Um, while studying for my graduate degree in mathematics here at NYU, one of my professors developed a new theory of particle physics. This theory was so important, he was asked to lecture at every major college and university in the, in the United States. To facilitate this arduous lecture schedule, he hired a limousine. The chauffeur drove him from college to college and sat in the back of the lecture hall while he gave his speech. One day after three months, the chauffeur turned to the professor and said, you know, I've heard your lecture so many times I could give it word for word. The professor said, I'm kind of tired of giving that lecture. And they stopped in a gas station, exchanged clothes, and the professor wearing the chauffeur's uniform drove the, professor, the chauffeur into the next college, the professor sitting in the back of the room. The chauffeur gave the lecture word for word and received a standing ovation. Then the first graduate student stood up and asked a detailed technical question. The chauffeur didn't hesitate a second. He said, young man, that's a stupid question. And to show you how stupid it is, my chauffeur in the back of the room is gonna answer it for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, cyber weapons <clears throat> can be as sophisticated as nuclear particle physics and the weapons that they result. And, and can do widespread damage. But protecting ourselves with good cybersecurity practices is not so complex. The cybersecurity framework is a guidebook to businesses large and small for an economical security against cyber attacks. Today we have the real leaders, not the chauffeurs, of the cybersecurity framework to present to you the framework that is unique in the history of the United States for its importance to our safety its clarity, and its genesis in a government industry partnership. However, before I introduce our featured speaker, I must thank several organizations that have made this event po possible. First of all, thank you to New York University Polytechnic School of Engineering for hosting this event. Under the leadership of Professor Nasser Memon, NYU has developed one of the premier cybersecurity departments in the world. Second, the Sloan Foundation without whose generous funding, this event would not be possible. There are four co-organizers, professional societies of this event. ISACA, through its comprehensive guidance and services, defines the roles of information systems governments, security, audit, and assurance professionals worldwide. ISC Squared, the global not-for-profit leader in educating and certifying information security professionals. The CISSP certification has been recognized for five years in a row as the gold standard for the information security industry. IEEE, the world's largest professional association, 
dedicating to advancing technological innovation and excellence for the benefit of humanity, and ISA, the International Society of Automation, which develops standards, certi certifies, and provides education for automation profession professionals, including the ISA 99 cybersecurity standard for automation systems that is currently being ratified as an international standard by the International Electrotechnical Commission in based, based in Switzerland and is incorporated throughout the cybersecurity framework. ISA is also the founding sponsor of the Automation Federation. I must also thank our financial sponsors whose support for this event demonstrates their commitment to strengthen our public private sector support of the cybersecurity framework. SourceFire is the world's most widely deployed intrusion protection and prevention technology. Dell SecureWorks, through its end-to-end -end solutions and services and connected security strategy, helps customers across industries to solve some of the biggest security challenges. Aerohive Networks, the leading cloud-managed mobile networking platform, leverages the power of the cloud and its controllerless architecture to deliver unified, intelligent, and secure Wi-Fi networks. Rockwell Automation, the world's largest company dedicated to industrial automation and information for the connected enterprise, their industrial control system products and services operate tirelessly in national critical infrastructures and help keep manufacturing processes running safely and efficiently. Invensys, now a part of Schneider Electric, works in partnership with industrial and commercial customers to design and supply advanced technologies that operate their operational, optimize their operational performance and profitability. From oil refineries and power stations to mining companies, food and beverage companies, and appliance manufacturers, Invensys, market-leading software, systems and controls enable its customers to monitor, control, and automate their products and processes, thereby maximizing safety, efficiency, reliability and ease of use. And last but not least, my employer, Next9, with cybersecurity products that uniquely enable multi-site organizations to protect themselves against both external and internal insider attacks. Software that is used in over 4,000 locations in every one of the DHS critical infrastructure sectors, including power, oil, chemical, emergency services, and even the US Capitol itself. Next9 software is deployed globally by almost every major control systems vendor, including our co-sponsors Rockwell and Invensys. My good friend, Samara Moore, is Director of Cybersecurity Critical Infrastructure Protection on the White House National Security Staff. Samara coordinates activities across the federal government, partnering with the private sector in efforts to strengthen cybersecurity for our nation's critical infrastructure sectors. Prior to joining the National Security Staff, Samara was Senior Information Technology and Cybersecurity Advisor in the Department of Energy, focusing on energy sector cybersecurity and managing public-private partnerships. At the DOE, she played a key role in IT and cybersecurity governance, where she led the formation of the Electricity Sector Cybersecurity Capability Maturity Model, now followed domestically and internationally. Before joining the DOE, Samara was Director of the Office of Management and Data Systems in the Occupational Saf Sa Safety and Health Administration, as well as Deloitte Enterprise Risk Services. Earlier, as a consultant systems engineer and IT manager, <clears throat> she performed security assessments, managed security operations, and security planning for government agencies and private industry. Samara earned her bachelor's from Virginia Tech in accounting and information systems and her master's in engineering, management and systems engineering from the George Washington University where she is currently an adjunct professor. Over the last year, I have had the immense pleasure of working directly with Samara on the cybersecurity framework. I am in awe of how this soft-spoken lady has guided multiple government agencies and hundreds of well-meaning but very self-interested companies and industry organizations to arrive at a consensus on how to protect our critical infrastructure from cyber attack. It may be said that inaction surrounds our Congress. However, it may never be said that there is inaction around Samara Moore. It is with great pleasure I give you our distinguished lecturer, Samara Moore.
Good morning. So I'm working from this one, so I'm going to move this one over. <clears throat> Good morning, and thank you um, all for being here today and for the opportunity to speak with you about our efforts to strengthen the security and resilience of our critical infrastructure. I also want to thank um, the New York um, University Polytechnic Institute, um, as well as our co-sponsors that were referenced earlier today, um, and also those who helped to organize these events. Um, I must say, so I really appreciate the warm introduction, but everything I do is in partnership, and um, I've had the privilege um, in, this, in this seat as well as um, in, in my previous seat with DOE to really partner with some amazing professionals both within the government and within the private sector. And so the agenda that we have today and the progress that we've been able to make has truly been because of that partnership. And hopefully you'll see that reiterated in my remarks today. So I wanted to start by talking just briefly about the cyber threat. As you're aware, cyber threats take advantage of the increased complexity that we have within use of information technology. The technological advances in this space um, have really helped our businesses and our organizations achieve some efficiency and do a lot more to accomplish our business objectives. Um, However, with that, as well as the increased connectivity, both internally and with our business partners and with the public, um, that has definitely increased our concern of cyber threats. It has the potential to place our national security, our public safety, economic security, um, and public health at, health at risk. So this is clearly a priority for us to address these cyber challenges. You know, similar to financial risk and reputational risk, cyber risk can impact an organization's bottom line um, by driving up costs or negatively <laughs> impacting the ability to obtain revenue. In addition to impacting the integrity or the delivery of services, it can harm an organization's ability to innovate. Um, it can harm um, the ability to gain and maintain customers um, through theft of intellectual property, sensitive data, and customer information. You know, so to be clear, we are concerned about disruption and denial of services, but we're also uh, concerned about the economic, potential economic impact that cyber threats can pose. So the cyber challenge is not something that any one organization faces alone. We see it as something that we're dealing with within the federal government. Um, organizations who own and operate critical infrastructure are dealing with this. Um, organizations that may not necessarily be considered part of critical infrastructure are having to address cybersecurity challenges. And it's not just here within the US. We see this also as a challenge abroad. There are some trends um, that make this troubling and really give us a sense of urgency. So forgive me if you've heard this before, but I think it's, it's worth repeating. Uh, first, the threat that we're faced with is becoming broader and more diverse. As I mentioned earlier, as we leverage information technology and the benefits that come from that, we connect more internally, we connect more with our partners and with the internet. The potential vectors for cyber threats, essentially the surface um, for potential threats, is broader, and that's more that we need to concern about. You know, even if you're not connected, there is the trusty thumb drive, right, that organizations or people or malware can use to, you know, defeat traditionally air-gapped systems. So it's something that we really need to be concerned about. Also, the industries that we're focused on are very diverse. Um, and, you know, we talked about, someone mentioned the sectors before, transportation, energy, water, chemical. There's 16 different sectors, and this is a challenge for all of them. Um, but the challenge is not just about connecting desktops and servers and machines with wires. It's really broad of that. We have to find innovative solutions that will allow us to address not just the technical challenge, 
but uh, the risk management challenge, the business challenge, the human factors challenge related to cybersecurity. We have to find usable solutions because it's not just a technical issue. Um, and many of you may be aware that our users can be very innovative. If we don't find usable solutions to address the ch cyber challenges, um, you know, folks are using these systems to get a job done, to accomplish a security objective, not a security objective, but really a business objective. So we don't want necessarily to have workarounds that defeat our security <coughs> objectives. So second, we find that the threat is becoming more sophisticated. Uh, their malware that's available for the bad guys is getting badder. It's more sophisticated, it's getting harder and harder to detect, um, and it does more varied kinds of things and it can morph right before your eyes. So there's definitely a challenge with a dynamic threat here. At the same time, you no longer have to be a coder to use malware. If you're interested in it and you're willing to pay, and there's some even available for free, you can get access to malware on, over the internet. Um, here is a situation where unfortunately the bad guys can share information much more effectively than we can. Third, we're seeing that the threat is becoming more dangerous. We have malicious actors that are willing to actually take destructive actions. Um, and we've seen this witnessed in the 2012 Saudi Aramco incident. But to be sure, um, I don't want to focus on doom and gloom, but to, there's work to be done here. But I also want to note we're not just concerned about those intentional threats. Um, in particular, that is a trap that you can get into. I've heard many organizations say, well, I'm not a threat, I'm not a target. Do I really need to care about this? We're also concerned about unintentional cyber threats um, or threats that you may have a, cy a cyber threat that could have a physical impact. Um, you know, these can, again, maybe not intentionally, but also cause harm to people, to safety, and to operations. So our aim is to ensure that we are still able to deliver critical functions, accomplish our core business objectives in the midst of the cyber threats. So when we talk a little bit later about the cybersecurity framework, you'll see this represented in how the framework was put together and the cybersecurity practices included in it. So last month, the president issued a statement on the cybersecurity framework in conjunction with the release of the framework. It stated, as you see here, that cyber threats pose one of the gravest national security threats, sorry, dangers that the United States faces. So clearly this is a priority for us. Within government and within industry, even within academia, as we've heard of the programs here today, um, we're focused on how can we find ways to manage cyber risks to the delivery of services and accomplishing business objectives. This has really received a lot of attention, and rightfully so. We're seeing this now in the news. We're seeing this listed publicly by organizations as a priority, not just within the government, but within private sector organizations, within academia, and within industry. Over the last few years, the president has met with CEOs specifically to discuss cybersecurity and cyber risk management. And we're seeing increased awareness of cyber risk with business objectives, object, with business executives, and with boards. Um, in fact, we're being told that discussions are centered around several questions, which I'll go through here. One, what is our exposure to cyber threats? Could what we're hearing about in the news happen to us? If so, what's the potential business impact of that? And what are we doing about it? So if you're hearing that, and maybe because we've been planning those questions and encouraging that type of dialogue, um, if you're not hearing that yet, I encourage those of you that are owning and operating uh, critical infrastructure and the information systems to be prepared to answer those types of questions. 
So last February, the executive order on improving critical infrastructure cybersecurity was released. Along with it was released the Presidential Policy Directive 21, and in that it states, as you see quoted here, it is the policy of the United States to enhance the security and resilience of the nation's critical infrastructure to maintain a cyber environment that encourages efficiency, innovation, economic prosperity, while promoting safety, security, <coughs> business confidentiality, privacy, and civil liberties. To accomplish this, we have really been focused on partnership um, with many of you and your peers in critical infrastructure. It is truly a shared responsibility. Um, the, there's a statistic that approximately 80, 85%, my colleagues at DHS may have the correct percentage, but a significant portion of our nation's critical infrastructure is owned and operated by the private sector. We see this as an area where we have a responsibility clearly to address the cyber challenges for the infrastructure that we own, but then also to partner with our colleagues within industry in their efforts. Also, government has a role uh, with information sharing as well, and so we are working closely in partnership, and that's one of our main, main priorities. However, as we've done outreach over the last probably 12 to 18 months, I commonly get a question, am I considered critical infrastructure? Does this really apply to me? So I did want to talk about that just for a second to clarify that for our efforts in this space, we're referring to those functions that make up a sector and the ecosystem that supports it. For example, I refer to the energy sector. It includes two subsectors, electricity and then oil and natural gas. Within just electricity, there's a further breakdown for distribution, transmission, and generation. That's just one example. If you take another sector like transportation, it will break down to, I believe, about six different subsectors. And you can go on and on. There's clearly an ecosystem here. And that ecosystem includes all the organizations that support and enable delivery of critical infrastructure functions and services. It also includes our local, regional, and national considerations. Collectively, we view this ecosystem as enabling and supporting our critical infrastructure, and our efforts are geared around what we like to call the critical infrastructure community. We also believe this is important because we recognize the interdependencies both within a sector and across sectors. Um, we've seen this highlighted repeatedly on the physical security side, um, in particular you know, with natural disasters, uh, but we also see this on the cybersecurity side. So with that context, I'd like to briefly discuss some of our efforts under the executive order and then provide an overview of the framework. We view the ex executive order really as one tool within the toolbox. There are limits to what you can do and accomplish with an executive order. Um, an executive order is essentially the president giving direction to executive branch departments and agencies. However, because, as I mentioned before, to really make progress in this space, we have to partner with um, others outside of the government. This effort moving forward has really been a strong partnership with industry. So I'll, high, I'll mention just quickly some other priority areas. As I said, the executive order is one tool in the toolbox. We're also working on securing our federal information systems. We're working on developing and impro really improving and strengthening our incident response capabilities. We're focusing on engaging internationally, and we're focusing on workforce development and research and development to really develop innovative solutions for tomorrow. So consistent with the National Infrastructure Protection Plan, 
The executive order aims to strengthen our capabilities to identify, assess, and manage cyber risk through information sharing and adoption of cybersecurity practices, and doing all of this while providing protections for privacy and civil liberties. So a key component of this is information sharing. And we strongly believe that information sharing goes hand in hand with adoption of cybersecurity practices. Within government over the last year, we have made significant progress in strengthening our programs and our ac activities to improve the quali quality and timeliness of our information sharing with private sector um, at an unclassified level. Agencies have worked together to improve their processes to get information, um, more substantive information out in a more timely manner. And we've received some feedback that we're making progress in this area. We recognize that this is an area where more needs to be done, but working together, we're moving forward. We also, though, acknowledge that there's the need for cleared professionals so that we can share classified information. And to support that, the Department of Homeland Security has um, made some revisions to their existing private sector clearance program to expedite the clearance process for private sector critical infrastructure entities. And we're already starting to see the fruits of that and that process moving forward. We also work to expand the Enhanced Cybersecurity Services Program for all of critical infrastructure. So this was a program that was in place with the Defense Industrial Base where the government shared classified information with uh, cleared defense um, contractors. The way this program works, information is shared with uh, authorized either companies or their commercial service providers that can be used in the protection of their systems. We're really excited and pleased that this, infor that this service is now available for all sectors and we're starting to see other critical infrastructure sectors leverage this program. However, we believe that the business to business sharing is very valuable, particularly as you own and operate your environments and have much better visibility and situational awareness than the government has, and rightfully so. So we continue to encourage organizations and companies to participate in information sharing forums, such as information sharing and analysis centers, or other forums such as US CERT and ICS CERT, or sharing with your trusted partners. So I mentioned that the executive order was focused on information sharing and adoption of cybersecurity practices while providing protections for cyber, uh, privacy and civil liberties. To talk some about adoption of cybersecurity practices, again, we believe that the information sharing goes hand in hand with that. To raise the bar, we believe information sharing is most effective when it's coupled with a cybersecurity capability that's in place within an organization. This really allows for more effective and more timely use of information once it has been shared. So what are the practices that I'm referring to? I'm referring to practices related to detection capabilities, protection and res response capabilities. Um, we feel that to really have a risk-based and cost-effective approach, organizations have to determine that right mix of protective, detective, and um, response capabilities or recovery capabilities that make sense given their business needs. So the practices that we are promoting are not necessarily new practices. These are known practices. Um, and based on input that was received from industry. NIST will talk about um, the process to develop the framework as part of the panel, but what's represented in the framework is based on the feedback that was received from our industry partners that are working the cyber challenge every day. So for example, the practices address knowing what and how systems and information systems support delivery of critical functions and services. 
It includes applying appropriate standards and guidelines to protect against and detect cyber threats and to know how well you're managing those threats. It includes processes to address gaps and to do so throughout the system's life cycle, whether it's in operations, whether you're leveraging third-party services, or through your procurement. It includes monitoring for unexpected or anomalous activity. It includes having a plan B, essentially having a response or a contingency plan in place, and by the way, actually exercising and using the plan and then improving based on what you learn through those exercises. These are just some of the types of practices that are addressed within the framework. Today, there are a host of resources available within the critical infrastructure community to assist both with the public and private sector. Some examples are industry forums such as these, where you have an opportunity to learn about different initiatives going on. Uh, there are federal programs going on within many different agencies, for example, just a few, DHS, within NIST, within FBI. Um, there are programs going on within our sector-specific agencies, such as Treasury, um, DOE, Homeland Security, Health and Human Services, EPA, Transportation, um, USDA. And then we have associations and organizations, such as ISA, ISC Square, um, sector-specific trade organizations. Again, I could go on. There's a lot of work going on within the community, and what has been so nice about the framework effort is that we had the ability to pull these different efforts together, and the framework presents a logical grouping of the best practices and standards that have developed over the years from these different communities. So back to the executive order from last year. As a community, we've made progress, significant progress, through the release of the framework and the launch of the voluntary program. To support adoption of practices, this led the development of the framework. We really feel that this is a great example of a public and private partnership at work. It was no small task to pull together the framework and voluntary program, one that was relevant for both traditional information technology and for industrial control systems, and to do so in a manner that was relevant across all of the 16 sectors. This effort required engagement from across many communities, again, the owners and operators, government, federal government, state and local government, the vendor community, academia, civil society and the privacy community, and our international partners. And the international partners is one that um, I'll, I'll make a particular note on. It was very important, and this was feedback that we heard early on in the process. Not only does our critical infrastructure share borders with countries here in the U.S., but global company, the companies that make up, many of the companies that make up our critical infrastructure are global companies, and many of the systems and services that are used by our critical infrastructure are global. So really engaging with the international community was a priority for us. So the resulting framework uses a common language to address and manage cyber risk in a cost-effective way, <coughs> truly aligning with business needs and business drivers without placing additional regulatory requirements on businesses. In fact, we've heard that this is useful for companies from multiple different perspectives. There have been some organizations that have become early users of the framework. We asked companies to kick the tires for us early on in the process, and so we've gotten some feedback. We've heard that it's helpful with internal risk management in aiding in the communications internally. Uh, I discussed uh, the board level engagement, engagement with CEOs, but then also externally with business partners and with the supply chain. We've also heard, though, that in general, it supports a stronger ecosystem, which aligns directly to one of the objectives that I talked about earlier for 
having a strong, a critical infrastructure community with capabilities to manage cyber risk. Now the concept for the framework was not necessarily to prevent every single cyber threat or stop every single skilled, persistent, and well-resourced attacker, but really it was aimed at a risk-based approach to determine the right balance of practices to identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover so that we can right-size our cybersecurity programs based on an organization's unique business drivers, detect earlier so that we can prevent and then limit and contain harm, and reduce the noise so that we can focus our efforts on and force the attacker actually to work harder, that they can't take advantage of simple um, vulnerabilities. We really believe that enhancing the baseline, essentially raising the bar for our critical infrastructure, and again across our critical infrastructure, which is very diverse, would defend against a significant percentage of today's successful intrusions and allow organizations to detect incidents earlier and allow companies to, again to focus their efforts on addressing more sophisticated attacks. So this is an area that industry has been working on to address for years. Uh, this is evidenced by the existence of globally recognized standards and guidelines. And some examples of these were provided within the framework as illustrative references. For example, the ISO 27000 series or the IEC 62443 standards are great examples of this. So what does the framework do? That's what you're all here to hear about. Um, the framework references globally recognized standards and practices to help organizations understand, communicate, and manage their cyber risk. It provides a common language or a common lexicon for discussing cybersecurity both within organizations or with their partners. And again, it focuses on business drivers to guide cybersecurity activities and how you consider management of cyber risk. And it also offers guidance for how organizations can address privacy and liber civil liberties for their efforts in managing cyber risk. So as you see listed here, the framework consists of three components that really reinforce the connection between business drivers and cybersecurity activities. We have represented the framework core the framework profiles, and the framework tiers. So the framework core represents a set of common cybersecurity activities. Again, the activities and the cybersecurity outcomes included in the core are those that we received or NIST received um, as input from our industry partners that engaged in the process. This set of activities are broken into five functions that almost every organization should carry out to manage their cyber risk. So hopefully it's not an eye chart for those of you in the back. But the functions are listed here. Identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. The functions are intended to aid in communications and really align with existing methodologies for incident management. Uh, we've heard feedback from organizations that have used the framework that it aligns fairly closely with some of the practices and how they're doing businesses today. And it can be used to help show the impact of investments in cybersecurity. For example, investments in planning and exercises can support timely response and recovery actions. Resulting, resulting in reduced impact to delivery of services. Under each of, these service, uh, under each of these functions is a set of widely accepted practices. For example, some of these practices include managing remote access, secure configurations and changes, detecting potential cyber incidents or cyber events, and exercising response plans. Ultimately, each element within the core that you see represented here 
rest on an international standard or best practices. So I'll go to this slide just to highlight within each function or a set of activities um, that we call categories. So you have um, under the protect function, there's categories for access control, awareness of training, data security. And then if we go further to this example here, and this is an actual excerpt from Appendix A of the framework, you see that a category is then expanded into subcategories. And those subcategories represent cybersecurity outcomes. In particular, it was important um, for NIST that they focus on outcomes because you, want, you don't want to get prescriptive as to how. The intent is not to have the framework as a checklist of requirements, but more of to allow for flexibility and innovative, innovative ways to accomplish the cybersecurity outcomes. And then to the far right, you have informative references. And in the informative references are, for illustrative purposes, um, a set of standards and guidelines that are cross-sector, and it's intentionally um, just a subset because we wanted to focus on cross-sector standards and guidelines, where organizations can go to find more information about how they can accomplish the outcomes represented within the subcategories. So the framework core really is intended to um, provide an approach for organizations to develop what we call profiles. And the profiles would be, if I go back one slide, the profiles would be an organization determining, I'll go back one more, determining which of the subcategories and subcategories and then informative references that they would use to manage cyber risk within their organization. So a company would make that determination based on their risk tolerance, their business requirements, and their resources. A company could use a profile to describe currently where they are and what they're doing to manage cyber risk. They could also use it to drive change within their organization. Um, they could compare its current profile with a target profile and use that to help drive and track investments in cybersecurity. So the last component I'll talk about are the framework tiers. The tiers were a way to allow companies to identify how well their risk management practices are and to set a target for how developed they believe they should be based on their business needs. The tiers provide a mechanism for organizations to view and understand the characteristics of their approach to managing cyber risk and to communicate those characteristics and risk and needs better internally and with their partners and suppliers. And particularly, we heard loud and clear um, that organizations are managing cyber risk in some way, shape, or form. The framework is not necessarily to say, throw out what you're doing and come use this new process. It's really intended to integrate with existing processes um, for managing cyber risk. So you see some examples here. The tiers go from one, partial, to two, risk-informed, three integrated risk, I'm sorry, three risk informed and repeatable and, repeatable and four adaptive. Based on different business needs and different risk tolerances, organizations are not, everyone may not necessarily desire to be or it may not even be appropriate to be a level four. While we are encouraging companies to move from tier one to tier two, it's really based on um, the business needs of the organization, what tier they should be um, targeting and what tier they should be operating at. You know, in short, the framework is really focused on 
reducing and better managing cyber risk. And the tiers are a way to help provide that flexibility. If you look at what's included within the tiers, um, it looks at an organization's risk management process. It looks at how are they engaging externally. Um, it looks at integrated risk management program. It's really intended to bridge the gap between business and the technology and security operations such that cyber management of cyber risk is really tuned into the business needs of the organization. So for organizations that don't know where to start, we believe the framework can provide a good roadmap. For organizations that are already sophisticated, the framework is a way to communicate internally and externally with business partners. We've received positive feedback that the framework has been proven useful in different types of organizations and in organizations at different levels of sophistication. So we're really pleased to see how the framework continues to be used and the innovative ways that it's used that perhaps we weren't thinking of when we set out to do this. NIST will discuss this much further through the panel session, but I did want to provide an overview and, and, and a high-level walkthrough of the framework. So we recognize that the framework is released, but we're not done. We're also focused on use of the framework. And we recognize that one size does not fit all. Um, a common question that we got well, was, what does it mean to adopt the framework? And really, we recognize there's different ways that the framework can be used within organizations. Some organizations may be already doing some or many or all of the practices included in the framework, and they may find value in using the framework for continuous improvement and to aid in communications. Some may, again, find it valuable if they're just getting started. However, we truly believe that this flexible and risk-based approach is what we need to address cyber risk and really raise the level of cybersecurity capabilities across our critical infrastructure. But we do recognize that there is not a point in which we say, we've reached 100%, we've done all we needed to do, we can go home, we need to find new careers and new jobs. It doesn't work that way. Um, instead, we have to be focused on reducing and managing cyber risk. You know, this is a very dynamic environment. Um, the cyber threats are dynamic and change, but then really our business drivers and our business needs may be dynamic and they may change as well. So it really does require management of cyber risk. <coughs> So now we're taking steps to encourage use of the framework. Last month, DHS established the Critical Infrastructure Cybersecurity Cyber Community Voluntary Programs, or also referred to as the C-Cubed Voluntary Program. The C-Cubed Voluntary Program is a coordination point within the federal government for members of critical infrastructure and the ecosystem that are interested in improving their cyber resilience. The program is focused on, as you see in the goals represented here, supporting increased cyber resilience of critical infrastructure, increasing awareness and use of the cybersecurity framework, and encouraging organizations to manage cybersecurity as part of an all-hazards approach to enterprise risk management. So the voluntary program will provide forms for knowledge sharing and collaboration related to use of the framework with other participants. In fact, if you were to visit the website, there's a link provided here, you'll find lots of resources, both downloadable resources, but also access to perhaps some technical resources that can help, and then grouped by different types of stakeholders. There's support to state and local governments. There's support for small to medium business. Um, from the state and local side, DHS is partnering with the National Governors Association, um, the National Association of State CIOs to address this challenge. They're working with Homeland Security Advisors. And it's also intended to provide an opportunity to influence peers and other partners uh, within the critical infrastructure community. 
So aligned with this, DHS and sector-specific agencies are working in partnership with industry to develop and promote sector-specific guidance. So for example, you know, energy sector, the water sector, chemical sector, communication sector, health sector, uh, are all working on this. Within NIST, NIST has a cybersecurity center of excellence um, that's working with owners and operators to develop sector-specific use cases and build out security platforms based on the framework. The Department of Energy <laughs> is working with industry to develop sector-specific guidance for use of the framework. That will also include how leveraging the cybersecurity capability maturity model can be leveraged for use of the framework. In fact, at the same time that the framework was released, you know, DOE also released two new versions of their maturity model, one for the electricity sector, um, one for the oil and natural sector, and then a generic version that can be, be used. We're seeing uh, other examples of guidance. So American Water Works Association also that very same week last month released their cybersecurity guidelines for uh, critical infrastructure and industrial control systems within the water sector. And that's available up on the website. We see another example of the high trust standards for health services that has been available for some time. We also see this uh, with, uh, within the chemical sector. We see it within the communication sector. There's lots of momentum and work going on here. So we're really excited about the sector-specific tailoring and use of the framework going forward. So again, DHS will discuss um, the voluntary program in more detail through the panel session. They were giving me a hard time by not taking too much of their talking points. So I'll save, save that for their, for their dialogue. But I do encourage you to visit the website that's here to learn more about the program and how you can be engaged in the program. So as part of this discussion, I did want to mention what's happening um, in other related areas that were addressed within the executive order. As it relates to the existing regulatory environment, the administration aims to encourage harmonization among existing cybersecurity regulations and between those regulations and the framework. The goal is not to expand regulation. Rather, our goal is to streamline existing regulation where possible. So again, I said earlier that the executive order provides direction to executive branch agencies. So for those executive branch regulators, they are reviewing their existing regulations um, and voluntary programs as well in this area. In May this year, consistent with the executive order, these agencies will propose prioritized risk-based actions to mitigate cyber risk, many of which, in fact, overwhelmingly from the, the engagement that we've been having are really focused on voluntary, leveraging vo the voluntary approach and voluntary efforts. For those sectors where regulations are already in place and they already exist, agencies could engage in processes to support efforts to harmonize and align with the framework. So again, that's work that's going on within the executive branch um, regulators. For the independent regulators, uh, the executive order cannot direct any action. However, we have invited and encouraged independent regulators to engage in a similar activity. Lastly, we're continuing to analyze and develop incentives to encourage use of the framework. We believe that developing incentives um, is key to our goal to raise the bar of cybersecurity across our critical infrastructure. So this is another example where our partnership and engagement with industry has been really important and that will continue as we move forward. We've recognized that one size does not fit all here either, surprise, surprise, and that the set of incentives that were identified last summer um, may be relevant for some organizations and then not so relevant for other organizations. 
the community has different stakeholder groups, both within the 16 sectors and across the sectors. For example, you've got large organizations that may be fairly sophisticated and technical assistance may not be as relevant for them. We've got small to medium sized businesses. We've got public utilities. Or there could be some other different differentiators. So as further analysis proceeds, each incentive area, we will look to further define how the framework would be applied to them. We're also, as we do further analysis, we're identifying that some of the incentive areas, which I'll go through here in a second, um, may have a more direct impact, and some of them are more indirect impact. So we've worked to further define the scope and path forward for the following incentive areas. Technical assistance and process preference, cyber insurance, grants, cost recovery, public recognition, regulatory streamlining, research and development, and government procurement. Liability limitations was one of the areas that was identified in those reports last summer. And to back up, those were, we received incentive analysis and recommendations on incentive areas to do further work on from the Departments of Commerce, Treasury, and Homeland Security. And one of the areas that came up was liability limitations. And this is an example of an area under discussion that would ultimately require new legislation for us to um, address if the country decides this should be enacted. As we learn more about how the framework is being used, um, we will be able to get a better sense of how to create and promote the right type of legislative actions. So as these plans to further analyze and develop incentives develop, we will make them public. They should be coming public here in the coming weeks. However, I do want to note that we believe the best drivers, and we've heard feedback related to this um, from our industry partners, we believe the best drivers for this will ultimately be market-based. Um, while the government-based incentives are important for us to pursue, and there's certain uh, subsets within critical infrastructure where it's really important, um, ultimately the market will drive the business case. So in closing, I want to highlight the need for several other important activities that weren't necessarily within the scope of the executive order, but are priority areas and really uh, directly um, related to supporting the overall objective of the executive order. One of which is workforce development. Um, it's really important to have uh, a workforce that understands cybersecurity, can uh, apply innovative ways to address the cybersecurity risk, um, but also can understand the impact to business needs and develop the right, the right mix of uh, protection, detection, response, and recovery measures. And we need to work with our workforce that's in place today, as well as help to develop the upcoming workforce. Another area is secure engineering and systems development. And then continued research and development to find innovative ways to address the cyber challenges of today and tomorrow. So my ask of you here is to use the cybersecurity framework, read it, see how it may be relevant for your organization. Um, we encourage voluntary use of this framework by critical infrastructure organizations or any other organization that wants to better understand how it's managing cyber risk, perhaps wants to increase their efforts and strengthen their efforts on how they're managing cyber risk or wants to have a common lexicon or a common way to communicate with the community. or by academic institutions, and I'll say that, you know, as an adjunct professor, um, we're always looking for ways to um, align our curriculum with standards and best practices. So use the framework. I'm excited about how the new framework and the C-cubed 
voluntary program is taking off. And for, I'm excited for the community as well. We see lots of momentum and we hope to see that continue to move forward. We look forward to our continued partnership as we work to support a whole host of efforts related to addressing cyber risk. I thank you for your time and look forward to the discussions with our distinguished panelists. Thank you. Right at this moment, online vulnerabilities are being exploited. Intellectual property is being stolen and critical infrastructure is getting attacked. The race to stay ahead of cybersecurity threats is accelerating. So now's the time to ask yourself, are you in the driver's seat? Whether you're looking to expand your own knowledge or providing training opportunities to your staff, a master's degree in cybersecurity from NYU will help you stay ahead of the pack. For over 10 years, NYU Poly has offered the flexibility of anytime, anywhere learning with one of the best online programs available. Our unique management track gives professionals like you 24-7 access to an award-winning online platform, hands-on learning in our virtual cyber lab, world-renowned white hat hackers from companies such as Goldman Sachs, Secret Service, and Twitter, and qualification for an information assurance certificate from the National Security Agency. Plus, with the recent merger of NYU, you're part of the largest private research university in the United States. My name is Jake Miller, and I just graduated from the NYU Poly Cybersecurity Master's Program. The NYU Poly online program really suited my needs. I could sit down in front of a computer and take all of my courses, perform all of my coursework, and be able to do it without interrupting significantly my family. I've been able to learn a lot of tips and tricks, which I could then take and apply to my career. I would recommend the Poly Cohort Program to anyone. It will take your skills that you have already, and really multiply them. It's an excellent program and I've had a lot of fun doing it. So go to the next level with our Cybersecurity Master's Degree Program. Secure your future today. This is an engineering school. So we all know there are three types of people in the world. Those that can count and those who can't. Today we have four, let me check, distinguished panelists. Bob Kalaski is the Director of Strategy and Policy for the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Office of Infrastructure Protection. He leads critical structure in initiatives. Previously he served as Director of the Integrated Task Force for the implementation of the Executive Order 13636 on cybersecurity and for critical infrastructure and presidential policy directive 21 the implementation. He is an accomplished strategist, planner, organizational leader, author, analyst, focusing on solutions to public problems. Earlier he was assistant director for risk governance and support in the office of risk management analysis. He also led the first strategic national risk assessment in partnership with FEMA. Bob served as managing editor of intellectualcapital.com and director of content at policy.com. His undergraduate degree is from Dartmouth and his master's of public policy is from the Harvard Kennedy School where he concentrated on business and government policy and microeconomics. Our second panelist, John Boyens, is a senior advisor for information security in the Information Technology Laboratory within the Department of Commerce's National Institute of Standards and Technology, better known as NIST. He leads NIST's Information and Communications Technology Supply Chain Risk Management Program and works on policy and technical projects. John helps develop and coordinate the department's cybersecurity policy among the department's bureaus. He represents the department in the administration's interagency cybersecurity policy process. He has worked on various White House-led initiatives, including those on trusted identities, potnets, supply chain, and most recently, the cybersecurity EO, executive order, and related work on cybersecurity initiatives and the cybersecurity framework. 
John was named to the 2013 list of the top 100 government industry and academic leaders in the federal government IT community. The award recognizes individuals who are making a difference in the way technology has transformed their agency or accelerated their agency's mission. Our third panelist, Manny Cancel, is Vice President of Information Resources at Con Edison, operator of one of the world's largest, most complex, yet most reliable energy delivery systems in the world's most dynamic marketplace. Before his appointment as Vice President, he held numerous other positions of increasing responsibility in auditing operations and information technology. At Con Ed, Manny is responsible for all aspects of information technology, planning, application, development, and deployment, as well as cybersecurity. Manny, who has led numerous technology initiatives at the company, helped develop and enhance the company's current cybersecurity programs. He holds a BBA in Management Information Systems from Baruch College and is completing his MBA at Cornell's Johnson School. Our fourth panelist, Chris Boyer, serves as Assistant Vice President Global Public Policy at AT&T Services. Focusing on cybersecurity, he is responsible for developing and coordinating the company's public policy positions, governing emerging, emerging services and technology. Chris participates in a wide variety of legislative, regulatory, and policy proceedings, representing AT&T before stakeholders at federal and state levels, as well as international forums. Chris serves as AT&T's representative on the board of the National Cybersecurity Alliance, a public-private partnership promoting cybersecurity awareness for home users, small and medium-sized businesses, and K-12 through education. A member of the National Institute of Standards and Technology, Internet Security, and Privacy Advisory Board, he serves as co-chair of the Cybersecurity Policy Committee of the Communications Sector Coordinating Council and as co-chair of the Public Policy Committee of the Messaging Anti-Abuse Work Group. At AT&T, Chris has held various positions in corporate public policy, network planning and engineering, product marketing and network services, including extensive experience working on UVerse, broadband, voice over IP, and IP television. He earned his bachelor's in business administration from the University of Kansas and his MBA from the University of Houston. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished panelists. <laughs> Gentlemen, when I was at the White House launch of the cybersecurity framework three years ago, and today, then Secretary Johnson of the Department of Homeland Security announced the new CQ program, and today Samara mentioned the new CQ voluntary program, to help businesses large and small to benefit from the cybersecurity framework. Gentlemen, can you please tell us how DHS new CQ security program really will work? Sure. And by gentlemen, I think you mean me. Um, th 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 thank you, Michael. And, and just to correct, three weeks ago you were there, or four weeks ago you were at the kickoff of the cybersecurity framework, not three years. Um, but it seems like three years, I'm sure. So, <laughs> so um, the, this, the CQ voluntary program, which is um, within the Department of Homeland Security, was called for, as Samara mentioned, in the cybersecurity executive order. Um, it builds on a lot of the work we've been doing since the department stood up, I guess, <coughs> nine plus years ago now, or t I guess 10 plus years ago now, um, where w one of the immediate mandates we had in the face of the department standing up, uh, which obviously happened because of incidents that happened near here as well as in D.C., and challenges to our nation's critical infrastructure, were to work largely in a voluntary manner with industry to raise the level of infrastructure protection, infrastructure security, infrastructure resilience in the face of a very real and continuing terrorist threat. And we've learned a lot of lessons over, the, over that period of time of how to work with industry, again, mainly in a voluntary manner, 
to share information, to build trusted relationships, to build structures that, that allow industry to share information with the government and, and, and to be, protect that information, allow the government to share information that's highly sensitive and, and at times classified with industry, and to work together to come up with risk management solutions in the face of, of, of challenges, again, mainly around the challenges that are presented to us from international terrorists and those inspired by international terrorists. Over time um, and other events, we have expanded the way we thought about infrastructure protection and infrastructure security and resilience to include working together to deal with extreme weather events, um, again, stuff that, that unfortunately you've experienced here with things like Superstorm Sandy and working on resilience there to share information, to, to raise the level standards and practices, um, to deal with things like pandemic pandemic influenza and the, the, the risks associated with pandemic influenza. So, so we sort of have a, a good baseline of, of working together with industry in public-private partnerships to, to share information, to manage risk. The C-Cube Voluntary Program, which DHS runs, is the next evolution of that voluntary partnership, um, the, cyber the critical infrastructure cybersecurity community. Um, what we are going to do within the, the CQ program is, first and foremost, we are putting together a number of um, awareness efforts in, in phase one to get the word out about the, the existence of the cybersecurity framework, how the cybersecurity framework works, um, how it can be used <coughs> across industry. But that very quickly goes into more specific work that we can do to provide technical assistance. Um, work with the specific sectors of the economy, critical infrastructure sectors, which Samara was talking about, to provide sector-specific guidance, working with industry to do things like develop sector profiles, working with our sector coordinating councils and, and people like Chris, who, who sit on our communications sector coordinating council. Um, we will be pr working through that and providing structure to facilitate the um, development of um, sector-specific guidance. We also will be providing technical assistance through something that uh, we do called a cyber security resilience review, where we will be working with individual businesses to help them use a tool to help them assess where they are in terms of cybersecurity resilience um, consistent with, with the cybersecurity framework and see kind of how that maps with how other how other critical infrastructure owners and operators are in terms of where their entities are and, and to make some comparisons and lead hopefully to improve risk management decisions. Manny and I were talking before the panel and Con Ed had worked with us on that. So, so those are some of the specific areas. The, the final area that we're really cognizant and looking to do is to use the CQ program to drive further government to government collaboration, government to industry collaboration, and industry to industry collaboration. Um, we recently put out a request for information to industry asking them to come up, give, give us some ideas of how they can work to provide um, small and medium sized businesses with solutions um, in terms of how to help them adopt the cybersecurity framework and drive the cybersecurity framework down to small and medium sized businesses. That RFI is out on the street right now and we'll get answers back um, by early April, and we'll be considering that within the context of the CQ Voluntary Program. And then the last thing I would say that we're doing that we're very excited about is we're using the CQ Program to work with some of our partners to um, provide managed security services to our state partners who adopt, state government pop partners who adopt the cybersecurity framework. And so there's an example of how we are taking advantage of, of the cybersecurity framework and building some scale, economies of scale by use of cybersecurity framework, and then we'll be able to offer free managed security services consistent with the framework to help not just with the use of the framework, but the use of the framework to reduce cybersecurity risk at the state government level. And, and that's one example. And we hope to do things like that and continue to think about business and market drivers that can um, promote adoption of the cybersecurity framework. Thank you. John, you were instrumental, and NIST is really the author of the document. Um, how do you see, uh, what does it mean to companies to adopt or use the framework? Uh, so to clarify, I, I would almost, so we, we held the, the pin, right? We helped facilitate, we, but we really weren't the, the, the authors. It was the, the stakeholders that participated in the, the year-long process that are really the, the authors. So when, when we think of adopt, it's really when an organization uses the framework to manage its risk. I mean, it's very broad, very uh, straightforward. 
That's what we mean. Okay. Manny and uh, Chris, what's your take on the framework? And how are your companies planning to incorporate the framework into your business? So while we haven't formally adopted the framework, um, we've been doing many of the, you know, the elements that are in there, I think, for several years now. Um, so it's actually helped you know, validate some of the approaches that we've had uh, and strengthen them. Uh, and currently what we're doing now is taking a closer look and performing a gap analysis, not only with this framework, with, but some of the other compliance standards that we have to adhere to in the energy industry, so we make sure that we're covering all our bases. But we found it to be a very useful tool. Um, as Bob said, it's simple. Uh, we like the fact that it's sort of risk-based uh, and, and, and can really allow us to sort of walk through and catalog the various cyber risks that we're exposed to uh, and then develop programs to move forward. And I think the other big benefit that I'd reiterate is the information sharing. And we've seen uh, sort of a marked difference. Samara talked about this earlier today uh, between sharing between the federal government and the private sector. Uh, and as Bob mentioned, we've been working on uh, various activities with DHS and FERC um, to just become more proficient in this area and make sure that we are protecting ourselves from these threats. Yeah, so from, a, from an AT&T perspective, um, if, if you followed the launch of the framework, our chief executive officer participated in the release of the framework at the White House back on February uh, 13th. Um, so we've generally been very supportive of the framework. Um, I think in terms of how um, we are going to look at the framework, we, we have an already, um, similar to what Manny was talking about, we already have a fairly uh, robust risk management process inside AT&T for cybersecurity. We view ourselves as one of the industry leaders in that area. Uh, so the framework should be a complement to our existing programs. So we're, we're kind of looking at the framework and seeing how does it fit with what we're already doing. You know, how does, how, what are some places where the framework can help us identify areas of improvement. So basically it becomes a complement to our existing risk management program. And I think there were, there were, there were really um, some areas that we were really encouraged by in the framework itself. Um, you know, the fact that it's voluntary and that it's, I view the framework as basically a menu of standards that people can pick from. Um, we feel like that's extremely important because, um, you know, if you follow cybersecurity, the threats are constantly changing and evolving, so there needs to be some flexibility built in the framework so that we can focus our attention on the, the most current threats that are out there. Um, another aspect of the framework that was positive is that it really includes all this, um, as Bob talked about and Samara talked about this morning, you know, all 16 sectors of critical infrastructure, which is really important as well because no one can do it all alone on cybersecurity. It's important that, you know, all of the sectors of critical infrastructure kind of each have a stake in trying to address the problem. And the last thing on the framework that, that I think is really important doesn't get discussed quite as much is the international aspects of the framework. You know, the framework is built on top of a lot of international standards and it sets a model uh, potentially that can be ported to other countries that are also looking at cybersecurity. So we feel like it sets, a, it sets the right example and the right model internationally about a, a, uh, you know, a true partnership between industry and the, and the government in trying to deal with cybersecurity. So we'd like to see that, so the similar model to what was done in the framework expanded out into other, other areas of the world. Bob and John, uh, will there be any incentives to encourage use of the framework? And if so, what do you see on the horizon? Sure. So, so Samara talked about um, seven or eight different incentives categories that, 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 that John and I's departments had, had made recommendations associated with and, and then ultimately have entered into the policy process. I mean, I'm going to and we always quote Chris's CEO, AT&T's CEO, and, and Samara did this earlier. The, in, the number one incentive for this is to look at what's happening on your cybersecurity system and understand you've, you've got to raise your game in the face. And I'll let Chris speak to whether AT&T needs to raise its game. But businesses have to raise their game in the face of the cybersecurity threats that, that we're seeing. And so we, we don't want to get so caught in government interventions to promote adoption of the framework that, that we lose the bottom line, which is this is intended to lead to better security and that the best incentives, as Samara said, are, should be market driven and this has to make business sense. And so to the extent the government is going to intervene by providing incentives into the market, it's hopefully going to be a relatively light touch and some of the incentives will continue to come from market. So we'll, we'll continue to look for how we can use our procurement processes to promote adoption of the cybersecurity framework. We expect that businesses will also look at their own procurement processes for their suppliers, AT&T suppliers, Chris is, Chris is nodding for that, and that. So, so there will be an incentive associated with contracts. Um, we've had positive con conversations with the insurance industry. There may be some incentives about the framework helps you go through the cyber insurance process, but the cyber insurance process is, is nascent, 
and immature, and that's going to build over time. Um, as I talked about, we can provide some direct incentives to state governments. We'll, we'll look at our grants programs. Things like that will be associated with that. And then the final thing, in, in which I, th I think particularly the energy and comm sector appreciate, but a lot of the other infrastructure sectors, is really looking at existing regulations and the extent to which the framework itself demonstrates to regulators a level of seriousness and compliance with, with what they're already being held to so that it can reduce the compliance costs and audit burdens associated with those who are, have people already looking at their systems and can use the framework as that. And those are the kind of, I mean, that's, that's sort of the magic that we're hoping to achieve through the framework where the government really doesn't have to do too much, but it just starts to make really good business sense as a way to demonstrate um, advanced cybersecurity. So, Anyone so else? I, 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 I would add that going towards the, the market driver aspect, I think it's, it's very important to understand how, the reasons why the voluntary framework was developed in a voluntary fashion. Now, some folks would, would argue there needs to be vast incentives to get organizations to use it, but one of the benefits of doing it from a voluntary standpoint is that it, organizations were more welcome, more willing to start participating in the entire process to build a framework and are more likely also to get that buy-in and start seeing how they can use it as a tool for either communication, for a risk management tool. And then, you know, what we're doing now is, you know, although we had a fairly broad stakeholder group helping us develop the framework, right now we're trying to get out and make, make folks and organizations more aware of what's going on. Things are different now than they were 10 years ago, all right? You, you look in the newspapers, the press, I mean, organizations are starting to get it. I think we're trying to raise the awareness. And so there's a little self-interest when it comes to that adoption, right? It's, it's, it's not just these, these, some of the incentives that Bob was talking about. It's that self-interest, that brand reputation, uh, the, the functioning of their organizations, so. Manny? Uh, and we'd be happy to hear about the incentives that argue uh, the incentive to stare me right in, at me in the face. Um, you know, many of you, I'm sure, are Con Ed customers. Um, we take the responsibility. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we take that responsibility very seriously um, and really do not want to see any kind of threat, physical or cyber, sort of uh, impact our ability to deliver energy. Um, so that's, that's our number one incentive, really. That's, that's, that's what we're most focused on uh, through the senior leadership of the company and including the board. Uh, but certainly we would, you know, would look, I think one of the big incentives that I think, uh, and again, I'll go back to sharing of information, um, to the degree that we continue to partner with the government and share information about threats and best practices and get information about what other companies are doing in this space, I think it, it makes us stronger. Yeah, so it's been similar from an AT&T perspective. I think when our CEO spoke at the uh, kickoff event, I think he said fear was his, his greatest incentive. So uh, I don't know if, you know, I think that if I translate that, I think, I think it's the same things that Manny said. I mean, our company is only as good as its brand and its reputation. So the last thing a major enterprise like us wants to have is be the victim of a major cyber attack that affects our customers. So we have plenty of incentives already in place today to ensure that our network is protected from cyber attacks. And so um, I'm not sure that there is a incentive out there that I could say like government could offer at least from a finance, like an economic incentive that would say, hey, this is going to make investing in the framework the right decision for the company. I think the company has plenty of reasons to look at things like the framework and other security standards already. Um, there has been some discussion of other types of incentives, like, like limitations of liability around information sharing for security, which um, is something that's somewhat unrelated to the framework. It's some, more of a, but it, it is an issue that's being actively discussed in DC, and it's something that we've generally supported in terms of legislative uh, a process to, in order to ensure that more information is shared, that there's not going to be some liability risk down the road for companies that do that. Uh, but overall, I think we have plenty of incentives today to, um, to look at things like the framework. And I think um, Bob made a good point about the supply chain side. You know, I think uh, one of the values of the framework should be that if it, it and, and a lot of the suppliers can also be small and medium sized businesses depending upon where they sit, is kind of pushing um, some of the security standards downstream. So even if a company like ours feels like we are, we have a good cyber risk program, um, it, it should help bring some of our suppliers up to a baseline standard of security that will be beneficial to us in the long run. And the other thing is, is to the point about you know, AT&T's program itself, cybersecurity is a risk management exercise. It's not like anybody could sit there and say that, hey, I've got this solved or I've got it licked, right? It's, it's something that's gonna be, over time, you continually look at the threats, you evolve your practices, and, you kind of, and, you, and you're constantly going through that. I mean, that's an everyday thing for us, right? So, so the framework and documents like that can help guide 
you know, where, where we focus and, and, and become part of our risk management process. I think that's what the value will be. But um, so even companies that are really sophisticated, I think, can, can benefit from something like this because um, it's cybersecurity is an evolving thing that's always going to be changing. That's why the flexibility was so important, as I mentioned earlier. I think, I think almost, almost all of us have uh, received the email from Nigeria <laughs> or, the, or, the, or the, the, the long lost friend in London who needs some extra cash. Um, and and we're, we're familiar with certain types of cybersecurity issues, but one of the things the, the, the cybersecurity framework has tried to address is the difference between IT systems and OT systems, the operational technology, the control systems that control the power plants, the oil refineries, the network of AT&T as opposed to the office systems and the, and the, and the payment systems, uh, not to mention Target, of course. Um, and, and there's um, a, a real difference here. How do you see the, the cybersecurity framework, it, the challenges in protecting your OT systems versus your IT systems? Well, I'll start. I, I, I think there certainly is a challenge. Many of the OT systems are, you know, from a technology perspective, certainly more complex, uh, a lot more integration points. Um, they're exposed to the threats, you know, so some of them actually use the internet or public carrier networks to actually communicate. Um, and again, so we constantly have to sort of stay on top of that to protect that. But I think the framework, again, gives us a good um, a device to, again, inventory everything, uh, make sure that we do have sort of the appropriate policies and procedures around <coughs> access control. Um, and again, I won't go through the, the whole deck that Samara, uh, or the slide that Samara uh, reviewed, but all those elements, it, it, it's a framework to sort of look at uh, operational technologies uh, and, and develop mitigation plans for. I would, I would throw in there that in the development of the framework, we had a lot of uh, ICS uh, partners providing input, which is one of the reasons in the infor informative references in the, the core we list uh, ISA 62443 uh, as part of the international and widely used standards. Uh, also, uh, you know, Chris mentioned the supply, cha supply chain uh, for, the, for the acquiring partners. I would also say in the ICS side, it, for some of the vendors and the suppliers, it, the, it goes the opposite <coughs> direction, right? A lot of these systems last 30, 40, 50 years. The, 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 uh, the provider's brand name is on there, right? But they don't necessarily have the control over the, the folks that are using that, how the, the, the users are updating the patches, providing a lot of the security. So it's, I think the framework also provides that communication tool that you can have going the other direction too, right? What, what sort of support do you need? What, what, what are you doing to... Uh, how can we provide the support to protect your system? So I, I think that communication goes up and down the streams. Glad you mentioned that because that's the software my company provides. <laughs> but in any case, can, can do, do, um, Chris or, or Bob, do you want to touch on that at all? The, um, the, um, can you discuss the approaches to small and medium businesses to use the framework? I mean, AT&T and... Con Edison don't quite fall into the small and medium business uh, environment, but hopefully uh, all four of you could imagine yourselves as being a smaller company and how would you use the framework to, how would you advise a smaller company to use the framework to ensure uh, cybersecurity? And, and I think that's very relevant to your business in that a lot of smaller companies are in your supply chain and you might also want to address how important the supply chain or, in fact, how the, the, the people who supply you, know it or not, have become part of the critical infrastructure. So I guess I'll, 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 well, I'll, I'll kick off saying that when, when we start looking at it from, from the NIST perspective and a lot of the folks that have engaged in the, the process, we, we, we try to stay away from the small, medium terminology because in, in many aspects, a lot of the small and medium-sized businesses in the technology area or other areas are actually fairly mature and, and in some respects can be very adaptive and, and meet some of those high tier levels. So it's not necessarily the size of the company, it's, the, it's where that company sits in its environment, its, its mission business function. So 
I, I don't know if I'd categorize small, medium versus, versus large, but in terms of the, the different types of organizations, that was one of the challenges when developing the framework. But we were able to find that balance so that the, the framework can, can be used by the larger, more mature organizations, as well as by uh, organizations that have less resources or find themselves in a situation where they do not need to be a, a tier three or tier four uh, type of organization. And we provide a how to use section in the framework so that they can go through the different processes to determine where their, their risk profile should be and w what types of uh, management activities they should undergo. Standpoint. Um, when I think of the framework and what the goals of the framework were, part of it was just to raise overall awareness of cybersecurity and get get people in the C-suite or get the executives to be thinking about cybersecurity and you know is it something that's part of their risk program. So for small and medium-sized businesses, I think that that by promoting the framework through awareness of it and getting them to actually just start thinking about cybersecurity and how it affects their business is actually a, a step in the right direction. I mean, it's not, you know, there's, I think in the framework itself, there's 98 subcategories of standards and practices that are listed in there. But um, the way I've, al I've always understood it is that if you could just get a small and medium-sized business to do, you know, one thing in each of the five categories, um, you know, detect, protect, identify, and if you could just get them to focus on doing a few things in each category, the framework could help them you know, because it's flexible, because it's a menu, you know, allow them to sit down and say, okay, if I'm going to be worried about cybersecurity, what are, you know, a few simple things? What are the 10 things I could do to really, that I'm not doing today that I could do now? The framework should provide them some reasonable guidance about some practices and end results they can try to achieve that, and, 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 it, and because it's a menu, it can be cost effective. They can look at it and say, hey, they're not an at t they're not a, you know, um, Con Edison, they're not a huge company that can go out and is probably going to do a ton of stuff, but they might be able to pick, you know, what are 10 things off this list that we feel like would really help us, you know, have some form of a cyber risk management program, and I think that would be a step in the right direction. Yeah, using John's frame for a second of, okay, whether it's small or medium or immature, right, or whatever, right. which might be, if you think about what, what makes an organ, how you overcome an immaturity in an organization, and this I think comes back to what I was answering about the CQ program, it's either a lack of awareness, so, so awareness campaign and using, trying to get out there with the people who help make small and medium-sized business or immature companies aware. So using the associations that they already participate in, the industry groups, other things like that. So awareness is one area. The, the second is sort of the education portion of, you'll hear people say, well, I can't, I don't have enough time to look at all those standards and that, you know, I'm doing, I'm the chief security officer, I've got to worry about physical, I, I get, I don't, you know, this is just too hard. So, so how do we reduce the gap to make it easier? And I, I think exactly. that's where, technical assistance tools, simple evaluation tools, checklists of, of ways that you take, take the 90 informative references and, and turn that into a simple look at here, try to look at some controls. And then the final area is cost. How, how do you reduce the cost so that even if they, they're smart and, and they're aware of this, they're not seeing the incentive to accept more risk than, than, than perhaps you know, others in the supply chain or, or others would hope that they were doing it. And that's where we're looking at working with industry and some innovative solutions to bundle things to, to reduce cost of security services and things like that. So, so I, I think you have to come at it from a, a number of different reasons what, why there might be an immaturity there. And I, it'll take time, but, but I think this gives us a way to have that come. Well, I think, I think in, the, in the communication sector, I can tell you that you know, there, people think of AT&T, Verizon, and these huge companies that do communications, but I think there's something like 500 some odd carriers in the country that, do, that are a lot of small municipalities and others that have different types of communications come just like in the electric business. And I think what, you're, what you'll see there is that um, what our sector is planning to do is we're going to do some webinars to try to you know, promote through our, through our trade associations and other entities to kind of promote the frameworks so that those entities are aware of it. And also, we're going to have some of the different members that sit in different spaces, you know, from the most sophisticated to the least, you know, do some, <coughs> do, do some different case studies to talk about how are they applying the framework, what are some things that they're doing. So hopefully that will um, help educate people and give them an idea of like what are the things I can do depending upon where I sit in the space. And I, I think that's a point that's worth saying. I mean, we talk about big companies as monoliths. Right. But, but we like to talk about framework adoption also at the sort of entity line of business level within, yeah. within companies because and you guys who buy companies all the time and <laughs> divest from companies and all that, as you know, you're at different maturity points right. with different lines of business and you understand different parts of the system. And so the, the framework isn't meant for AT&T or any other big, or GE to adapt 
the, the whole, whole framework. I mean, right. there will be different entities at different points within GE, I'll pick on GE for a second, who will look at where it makes sense for them and then as part of the merger and acquisition, I, I think. Right. Well, we do the same thing. So like if we're looking at a, you know, for, the, for our enterprise business, right, we offer services to healthcare providers, we offer services to electric utilities, we offer services to financial services companies, and depending upon the line of business, we have to be certified against different types of standards. We have much higher bar to clear. So if I'm serving the federal government, I'm going to be probably FISMA certified. If I'm serving financial services, I'm probably going to be PCI certified, right? So if I'm doing work with healthcare, I'm going to be HIPAA certified. So depending upon the line of business, the level of sophistication is higher or lower. And so even in big companies, there's, you know, the flexibility in the framework is really important so that we can look at it and say, this is a higher risk, so your risk tolerance is a little bit lower, so therefore there's a little bit higher bar to clear, but if you're, you know, depending upon what the service is, it might be, there's a different model there. Has there been any resistance to adopting the framework? The, the, the resistance we hear, I, I think, tends to be more around uncertainty associated with what does adopting the framework mean. And we want more certainty that as we bring it into our business line. And, and so I, I don't think we've heard too much resistance to the core concepts in the framework as much as do we want to associate ourselves with adopting the framework? What, would, what does that mean to our business? And, and we're working over time on, on those sorts of questions. And again, some of that will just play out a, a little bit over because time. Because a lot of the, the legal implications, what does it mean to adopt? And we're, we're, that's why we're, we're going the extra mile to offer very broad definitions of, of use of the, the framework. So uh, in, in terms of pushback, I don't think we've really seen any. I, th I think we've been, uh, throughout the, the years, really we, where we've been kicking the, the tires on the utility and we've gone from fairly general and high level to very specific, working with all types of organizations to see if it sits into a lot of the sectors that are unregulated as well as the sectors that are regulated and have certain laws and, and how that flexibility <coughs> sits in there. And so far, uh, you know, we've been hearing all good things so far, but I think it's over the next few few months, over the next six, nine months, and looking at different organizations that start using it internally uh, to, to see what feedback we, we get from, from them. Uh, feeding off Chris's comment a little bit is what we're really finding out is not to dig too deeply down into the actual documents and the technical aspects of it, but there's the concept of the profiles. And what we're finding is that when organizations start looking at adopting it internally, especially large multinational organizations, that they have different uses for those profiles, right, internally. So one, one group can have a certain profile and implement, implementation of the, the framework where another part of the organization can have a different implementation. And that goes with the uh, uh, moving it down the supply chain as well. So I, I think what we're finding out and what I'm excited about putting my Nuri Beanie hat on is that it was initially built as a risk management tool, but we're, we're finding out as with any tool, it has many other uses. And I think that's the, the communication tool of communicating some of those uh, common lexicons and taxonomies throughout the organization internally and have that common messaging, but also in the, the vertical supply chain, right, in acquisition technology, but also uh, cross-sector and, and using a common lexicon to make these type of uh, security conversations across different sectors and between sectors. Um, Dean Trini would like to ask a a question. Um, mostly trivial. Um, two, this is all about business, which I appreciate is very important. Um, two weeks ago, as uh, we were talking earlier, the uh, University of Maryland had a cyber attack of some sort. Um, what is it that universities must be aware of, and, and what is it that this new um, framework Um, 
I, I mean, in some ways, I think the university challenge is similar to, you could be sitting as, in the panel as a participant, as somebody who certainly participates in the critical infrastructure community, if not, um, and we, we can argue whether universities in, in the intellectual property and the intellectual energy they provide are, are critical infrastructure or not. But, but there's certainly a decent argument you are, and so, so you look at, at whether using the framework, just like any other organization would use the framework, and do you have, are, you as, are, as you as the dean and your board of overseers, are you confident of where your organization is in terms of cybersecurity? Does the framework give you the ability to ask those questions? Um, one of the things we're putting out at DHS is sort of executive level, board level, CEO level. Here are the questions you should be asking to know about cybersecurity. We, we've, we've adjusted those um, to take in some of the, the, the framework language. And so, so I think that's an important element. And, and then shifting over, John, I mean, you, you just brought something that, you know, it's surprising actually. I think we're 40 minutes, 30 minutes into this and we haven't talked about privacy yet. And privacy was such a big part of the conversation. And as, as you as a university look at your risks, your risks <coughs> may be more associated with privacy, reputation, protecting, protecting individual things, and making sure you have as open a system as you can to encourage people to participate in the system and, and use it, which is probably a different way that businesses approach it. And, and so, the framework's intended to say, okay, these are the risks we're associated with in, in standard, in, in look at what standards, and, and privacy was certainly an important element of what ended up in the final framework in data protection, and we'll let John talk a little bit about that. Right, and the, the, our, uh, you know, privacy and civil liberties were clearly called out in the executive order. And so I think it was over the year-long process uh, trying to work and, and, and see how we can fit it into the framework, how it's going to fit in. And it evolved over time. I mean, clearly over the first few uh, workshops and engagements with, with the private sector, we were, we were dealing with uh, security professionals, right? We weren't getting the right people to the table. And it was towards the end of our process where we, we really made a, a focus to get a lot of the privacy professionals to the table and see what they had to say. And we, we finally did that around um, uh, November, one of our, our workshops in Raleigh. And through that, there was a kind of a, a groundswell of a lot of input on the privacy side of it. So when we put out our, our preliminary uh, framework back in October, we had an Appendix B, which really went through uh, the different privacy controls similar to our, our core. And the feedback that we received in doing that, a lot of the, what we were putting in there were the, uh, uh, the fair uh, information practice principles, uh, as well as an Appendix J from a government control catalog. So those were some of the things that we put in the appendix. The feedback we received from the, our request for information was, was very strongly that this sends the wrong signal, that there really aren't international standards and guidelines that are widely adopted out there. And then us, if, if we put that into an appendix in uh, the framework, it would discourage the use of the framework and kind of send the wrong signal. So we took that and on the final framework is what we did is there was a lot of discussion about an alternative methodology and we incorporated a lot of that alternative methodology into the framework and then uh, incorporated some of those, uh, the approaches of that alternative methodology which is really looking at how when you undertake cybersecurity activities, how does that impact privacy? And that, that, that's the general approach. Uh, so we're, we're not done. Again, this is a living document, but not only is the document living, we put out a companion document in the roadmap uh, that looks at a lot of the issues and areas that we want to address in the, the, the coming future. Privacy is a big one, right? We want to start looking at privacy standards out there. And so uh, in response, response to that, our first workshop that we're going to be having April 9th and 10th is going to f focus on uh, privacy engineering. So, so uh, let me just add one more thing, because I want to I, I make a fine point on this. I mean, my assumption is that universities are on the high end of wanting to maintain as open a network as possible, yet secure. And there, there are other parts of critical infrastructure which are pretty happy with a fairly closed network. So, so the, the framework was intended to get to both of those, but as I think you've indicated, one framework can't you know, give you a, a set of risk management 
risk reduction paths to both of those. And there, there is a need to, and you know, there's an opportunity for education institutions such as this to work on what does the framework mean for universities? What does it mean for, um, for in this space? And how can it be applicable? And, and where do you drive it? And so throw the offer back into communities like this. I mean, again, the government is here to support that and, and enable and facilitate that. But we want the organization to say, hey, let, let's make the framework make sense for universities. And let's take that on through whatever entity. And, and there, that parallel exists across industry. So I guess, I guess my perspective would be that the, the framework really can fit any organization, you know, whether it's an educational institution or a large company like ours, right? So the framework is really about processes, about risk management, right? So a university could pick up the framework and use it to, you know, uh, incorporate those processes inside their own entity to try to insure themselves against cyber. But I also think we have to be really realistic about what the framework can actually accomplish. There are a lot of companies out there, <laughs> a lot of institutions that have really sophisticated cybersecurity programs that still could be the victim of a cyber attack. It happens every day. You know, you read in the newspaper about some of these attacks, and you'll hear about really sophisticated companies that are victims of that. You know, the government agencies can become victims of that. So we have to be realistic that what, what things like the framework do is they give you an idea of how can you best manage your risk, but it doesn't guarantee that it's going to stop an attack like what happened in Maryland. And I think that I think you know the analogy I'll draw is to things like physical physical theft, right? We we you know you can put the locks on your doors, you can have monitoring services, but you can still get your house broken into, right? Cybersecurity is very much a very similar type of situation. You know, you can do everything you possibly can to have processes in place, have risk management, but it's all about out, you know, making that calculated or educated risk assessment of, you know, if I do the following things, have I reduced the risk to a point where I'm comfortable, you know, using the internet and using the various tools that are available to me, but you can never make 100% sure that you're not going to have these types of incidents happen. So I think that the framework is really designed, at least from my perspective in the corporate world, is how do, you know, what are, what are some ways that you can build out a risk management process to make sure that you're comfortable, that you've done everything you can, you know, within your risk threshold, your risk tolerance, um, to be prepared to deal with cyber threats, but, but realistically, this is an ongoing challenge, and, and one of the biggest issues with the framework is that because it's based on standards, it's necessarily backwards looking. So, um, you know, you have the other issue of a lot of the threats are constantly changing and evolving, and, you know, so innovation is the other side of this, right? So you can do everything you can with the framework and standards, but you also have to innovate, um, I think, to stay out in front of the attacks. So there's a lot of complexities there around that, but we have to be realistic about what this will actually accomplish. Can I ask a question? Of course. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> you want to know how the sausage was made. Uh, so, so in many aspects, I mean, I think one of the reasons why, why NIST was asked to undertake this as a facilitating role is some of our past work that we've done, right? We, we've, we've been a facilitator in some areas in the, the smart grid arena and the cloud arena, uh, in the trusted identity space. And uh, in, in some ways, looking at us as an honest broker, uh, looking at our mission in the Department of Commerce is really encouraging competitiveness and innovation. So we took that on as a challenge. Our, our real challenge is we can't mirror it to what we've done in the past because we had a timeline, right? We had a 240-day timeline to put out the initial public preliminary draft. So we initially put out a request for information last February, received roughly 2,500 comments from over 250 individuals. Processing those was quite the challenge, but really the, what we, we did, we stirred the pot, got the cream up, and took that cream into uh, a series of different workshops. Each one was uh, kind of fed off the other, and, and after every workshop, we would give an update, and it was, it was a, <coughs> We did our best to be completely open, transparent. We put all the documents up on our website, let everybody know where, what we were doing, Constant re constantly receiving comments and feedback into our inbox on different, different adjustments. Uh, overall, we had uh, two requests for information, uh, one in February, one this last October, and five different workshops uh, held around the, the company, all of them ranging in size between 350 to 500 participants. Uh, and then virtually as well. So I think we've, we've done our best to engage the broader community as much as physically possible in this type of process with so many different types of stakeholders, right? Remember, it's across 16 different sectors and subsectors that are extremely diverse, but also 
kind of vertically different types of organizations throughout those sectors. So it's, it's an incredibly broad sense of stakeholders and it's being able to take all those incredible thoughts, right? A lot of them, that is really what I think made in an, uh, a brilliant final product is all the different sharp minds that actually provided input into it. So that, that's where we are now, I think, going on in the future. We're, our attempt is, and one reason why we're, we're so happy to be here and in New York City, is that we're, we're getting outside of our, our usual folks that we're engaging with or that we have engaged with over the, the last year and looking for feedback and uh, raising the awareness as we go forward. Before I, uh, we're running out of time, so before I, I close this uh, session, is there anything that I haven't asked you that you would like to comment on, please? Well, with that, I, I, I guess, uh, I'm sorry, it's one, one more question from the audience. John, John or Bob, do you want to answer yeah. this? So, um, you, you know, the water sector in, in the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency participated in the framework development process. A, a couple things that we haven't talked about that we, we did in terms of part of the executive order work is we did look at across um, all 16 critical infrastructure sectors where there were cybersecurity incidents that had the potential to cause a catastrophic level of, of damage. Um, that's a very high threshold. We, we took the word catastrophic very literally, and we, f we found a relatively small group of entities where that level of damage is possible, and none of those were in the water sector because of the, the legacy ways that the water system worked. But, but we did a lot of modeling of the water sector and, and the functions of the water sector and rec recognized that, wow, you can't perhaps at this point, luckily, blessedly, have a, a cyber incident cause a catastrophe within the water sector, you can cause a whole heck of a lot of damage. And we start to look at what are the forces that <coughs> cause that kind of damage. Um, and so we looked at that. And then the framework itself, and this is a place where obviously the operation technology is a, a lot of what we're talking about, the OT and the and, um, SCADA systems and that sort of thing. A lot of what we're talking about in terms of the water sector, we're, we're continuing to work with partners to find out ways that, that we can further this adoption within the water sector as we make, hopefully, in what I believe to be necessary refurbishment in, in, in water facilities around the country. There will be a continued drive to efficiencies and set that up. As we're smarter about where cyber incidents can cause problems, we, we can build that into some of the refurbishment of water systems, the adoption of new technologies, rather than sort of have to deal with the fact that these technologies were adapted before the cyber threat landscape had been so expansive. And so that gives us an opportunity, and we'll be out there working very closely with EPA and the, the water sector coordinating council, the private sector folks, the, the state and local regulators who, or municipal regulators and water facilities to share best practices is as you make more investment in improvement in, in water delivery technology, other waste, <coughs> wastewater management technology, things like that, are you taking cybersecurity into account with some specific things, not just the, the kind of standards that are in the NIST frame or that are referenced in the NIST framework? Thank you. So with that, I'll, I'll leave you with one last little story. One of the great cyber sleuths of all time, Sherlock Holmes and his assistant Watson, went camping one day and pitched a tent and went to sleep. In the middle of the night, Sherlock Holmes woke up, and he looked up, and he saw the stars. He turned to Watson, woke him up, and said, Watson, what do you see? Watson said, I see stars. What, Sherlock Holmes says, what do you make of that, Watson? And Watson said, well, there are billions of gaseous objects up in the sky all generating heat and light at the same time. And Sherlock Holmes turned to Watson and said, Watson, you idiot, somebody stole our tent. <laughs> so my, my reason for bringing that up is please read the cybersecurity framework. It's an easy read, and it, it, it's, not your, it's not like your tax documents. 
Um, it, is, it is something which um, uh, you will see <laughs> upon reading it, that cybersecurity is not that difficult to do. An ounce of prevention is worth pounds and pounds of cure. And um, I'm looking forward personally to version two. This is version one. And I know we have plans for, for version two of the cybersecurity framework. And we're going to try it out with a number of major corporations, <laughs> small corporations. And we're going to make sure, see how it works, and improve upon it. And I hope you'll all join us in that adventure. It's a great adventure. Thank you to all the panelists. <laughs> Matthew. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone. I know you're eager to head out for lunch, but let me just hold you for two minutes. I was uh, asked to give you some closing remarks, and I would hate to lose an opportunity to talk a little bit about our program. Uh, so I'll make a few acknowledgments uh, at the end, but let me begin by just talking a little bit about our program. Uh, so as all, you've, as all of you have seen, cybersecurity has emerged as one of the most important challenges we face today. Uh, as everything gets digitized, everything gets connected, uh, the old mechanisms, the social pressures, institutional pressures, moral pressures that we had to create a society that could, a safe and secure and private society that allowed people to engage and realize their dreams and potential, uh, all those mechanisms are, are finding, are, are kind of becoming a bit outdated today, and we need new research, we need uh, new frameworks, and we need uh, newly trained, educated uh, people that can sort of face and surmount these challenges. And we at Poly have been at the forefront of doing these things. Uh, we are engaged in cutting edge research. We do work in hardware security, Professor Ramesh Kari and his students, uh, application security, secure virtualization, uh, with systems that are used by tens of thousands of people around the world. Uh, we've done work in forensics, uh, which, has been, which is being used by law enforcement and intelligence agencies around, around the world. And I can keep going on and on about research, uh, but a university's mission is, is not simply the creation of knowledge, uh, but also the transfer of this knowledge and creating human capital and, and uh, we have a very strong educational program. We were one of the earliest to start a master's in cybersecurity Oops. many years ago. Uh, it's an award-winning program. And uh, in, in addition, uh, we have a culture in, in our uh, open culture in, in, in the university uh, where we sort of, uh, we realize that security can only be learned by, by doing things. Uh, not by simply talking about it. So we have a very hands-on culture where we build things, break things. And we also engage in outreach. Uh, we organize uh, the largest cyber student cybersecurity event in the world where 10, 000, uh, tens of thousands of students participate. Uh, we engage uh, high school uh, students in summer camps to get them interested in security. We train uh, high school teachers in security so they can go back and teach their, their students. Uh, we, are, we are also involved in bringing women into security. Uh, we, we are uh, having summer camps for high school girls uh, and uh, also uh, for high school teachers, women teachers, uh, to sort of uh, uh, address that particular aspect, that big hole that we have in the security workforce today. And, and, we are, and as we merged with uh, NYU, we, we, our, our outlook of cybersecurity has, has expanded. We, 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 although we are an engineering school, we understand that security is not simply a technology issue. It's also a business problem. It's a human behavior problem. It's a policy problem. It's a legal problem. So in collaboration with NYU Law, uh, NYU Steinhardt, NYU Wagner School, uh, NYU Courant, we've created a center for interdisciplinary studies in security and privacy which in the next few years, we would like it to become uh, the leading center in cybersecurity in the world. Uh, we are very committed to doing that, and to do that, we need your help. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces today in the, in the audience, uh, but I see many new faces as well. Please engage with us. We are eager to work with industry and government agencies as we sort of work on the problems that, that face society today. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so. So I'd like to close by acknowledging uh, 
the Sloan Foundation for their general support for their generous support for making this happen. Please uh, give them <laughs> applause. Uh, I would. I would also like to thank again, I know he's been thanked twice already, Bob Ubell and his team that, who organizes this event. They do an impeccable, impeccable job. Uh, so Mar <coughs> Mar Marlene, Lisa, John, thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. And finally, I'd like to thank the students of Poly who really make every day enjoyable so, and who made, sort of make all this happen. So let's thank them as well.